Welcome. My name is Marin McHugh, and I am a Master of Social Work student at the University of Calgary. This presentation serves to share some context and learnings from my practicum project. The title has evolved over these past few months, and currently I've landed on the title Recentering the Heart to Deconstruct Colonial Consciousness from the Inside Out. A good place for us to start is to create a clear understanding of the context of this project and some insight into why we start here with the symbol of the spiral. This project began with inspiration from the work of Resma Menachem, who opened my mind to the possibility that racism and the legacy of colonialism resides in the body like a virus. Rather than pointing outwards to solve these systemic issues, I wanted to explore and experiment with what it looks like to turn inwards and begin the deconstruction of colonization from the inside out. As we move through this presentation together, and I share about my experience doing this work, let's be in the practice of noticing our reactions or impulse to defend, blame, or point our finger outwards. And instead, remind ourselves to turn that finger back in and spiral inwards to be with what is arising. As the first step, not only step, needs to be taking responsibility for the change we desire from the inside out. Now, before we move on, let's settle for a few moments to connect with our breath. So perhaps you could adjust in your seat, place your feet on the ground, or simply feel the chair or whatever it is you're sitting on. As that is support, you can allow yourself to settle into. Perhaps you can slow your breath down, maybe a hand on your belly and or heart. And over these next few breaths, notice what it's like to guide your breath towards a balanced rhythm. Perhaps you can soften a little bit more on your exhale and settle into the structure you are sitting on. And as you inhale, Perhaps you can relax your belly a little bit more so you can feel expansion, low belly, low back, ribs, and then heart. Three more breaths like that. And as we move through this presentation, I invite and encourage you to pause occasionally and check in with your breath as you just did. Finding balance, finding some softness and settling with what's here now. In the book, Decolonizing Trauma Work, Renee Linklater refers to the work of Couture, who says, traditional learning modalities eventually bring one to think intuitively, to think with the heart, to think circles, to understand and utilize dream, metaphor, and symbol. Throughout this journey, I had a few potent symbols arise for me that became both intriguing features for reflection and exploration as well as anchors at times that I felt lost or destabilized. As a practice of bridging Indigenous methodologies with Western academia, I have chosen to outline this presentation as a story told through symbols. I will share parts of my process as I approached my own psyche to begin deconstructing colonial consciousness by recentering my heart and how that led me to discern the significance between discerning 
between power over and the right use of power. I'll mention here that uh, I created a blog series throughout this practicum. If you'd like to explore more depth into anything that I share, you can find that blog series on my website featured on the top left corner of the screen. As a heterosexual, able-bodied, neurodivergent, cisgender female, and fourth generation Canadian with English and Irish heritage, I am aware that I am a settler on this land that I call home in Calgary, Alberta. And in many ways, I have unjustly benefited from the devastation and harm of colonization. While I am in the process of deconstructing colonial consciousness within myself, I have come to see colonial history as causing a legacy of separation from the earth, which is reflected as a separation from self. And from that heightened awareness, I have a deeper reverence and understanding of the medicine that is the land beneath me, around me, and within me. I am grateful to feel peace and connection on this traditional land of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Métis Nation Districts 5 and 6, and the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta which consists of Siksika, Gainai, Pikani, the Susina, the Ayox Nakoda Nations, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Goodstony First Nation. Allow a few moments here to feel and reflect on the land you call home and the areas you feel connected with or would like to foster a deeper connection with. The snake eating its tail, also known as the Ouroboros, provides a bit more context for the beginning phase of my project. To deconstruct colonial consciousness, one must be prepared for and develop trust in renewal or death and rebirth, a continual letting go of what was and a welcoming of what is here now. Referring to the work of Michael Noss, Drischel denotes that deconstruction is always referring to the self or autos, and as such, he goes on to say, deconstruction cannot but rekindle latent memories of a prior traumatized state, a colonial shattering of identity, or a wound inscribed at the heart of an identity no longer coinciding with itself, the recurrence of which is being anxiously defended against, which manifests as unresolved trauma and lingering vulnerability, a vulnerability that, rather than being radically accepted, is being defended against at all costs. Additionally, this symbol reminds me that we are multifaceted and multidimensional beings, and we attract and reflect what is already within us. As we develop the skill of observing ourselves intently in the process of deconstructing, decentering, and recentering, this symbol came to symbolize the importance of welcoming and holding space for the occasional vortex of confusion I would find myself in. Lastly, this symbol also captures the ongoing process of colonization being something that is continually recreated. And until that cycle can be seen, understood and disrupted, it will continue. It is vital that we practice shifting our perspective from the individual or micro to the collective of the meso and macro. Just as a wave is in motion, it rises and rests in a continuous pulse like a breath. Colonization ravaged the world as settlers arrived in spaces inhabited by indigenous peoples to then meticulously and violently separate them from their land, their spiritual rituals and traditions, and often pitted against each other as the fight for power, privilege, and freedom served to divide and conquer. The legacy of supremacy lives within us and is sustained through our systems, our language, and our continued indoctrination of separation and othering in white supremacy culture. 
From the lens of my personal and professional orientation, I recognize the need to balance micro and macro as social problems require complex and sustained intervention at all levels of social work practice. Expressing the sentiment of Paulo Freire in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Audre Lorde emphasizes that the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations with which we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us and which knows only the oppressor's tactics, the oppressor's relationships. Resma Menachem expands on this by stating that individual work is vital as healing from intergenerational and present day acts of violence and domination must begin with your body. With your body. He continues, but it does not end there. In order to heal the collective body that is America, we also need social activism that is body centered. We cannot individualize our way out of white body supremacy nor can we merely strategize our way out. We need collective action, action that heals. Researcher and educator Kimberly Todd says decolonizing needs to begin first internally in the mind, the body and the spirit, and then move outward to transform existing colonial structures. Activist and Buddhist minister Lama Rod Owens says there is no collective liberation without individual liberation. Understanding freedom for oneself makes it possible to understand and engage in liberatory work for the collective. As this section begins, I'll make note that in week seven of my blog series, I go in depth about these experiences I am about to highlight. So as for my own individual liberation, one of the parts of my psyche I was curious to explore and get to know more in this project appeared to me as a black hole. Coinciding with the black hole was an intense internal flail, as if a part of me was free falling and flailing in that black hole, which would leave me in a place of feeling overwhelmed and ungrounded. My theory was that this black hole and the inner flailer, as I had come to call her, was the legacy of the wound that Drischel refers to as a colonial shattering of identity or a wound inscribed at the heart of an identity no longer coinciding with itself. Drischel continues to describe how the recurrence of this violent separation is being anxiously defended against, which manifests as unresolved trauma and lingering vulnerability, a vulnerability that rather than being radically accepted is being defended against at all costs. I could sense this lingering vulnerability and this immense sense of separation, but I was not clear on how the anxious defense was showing up in my system other than this strong impulse to be distracted when I tried to move inwards to be with this constellation of parts on my own. So during week seven of my practicum, I had set myself up with the support I needed for this inner journey with a craniosacral session and a conscious breathwork session. My main intention was to explore power over versus the right use of power. I detailed again these experiences in depth in my week seven blog. So here I will simply point out some highlights and what has become more clear in my integration process. The infinity loop surfaced early in my first experience on that fruitful day of receiving support. I saw it as a continuity between present and past. Rather than time being linear, I felt and saw how updates in presence can reframe and influence the past. And when we reframe the past, that can change the way we show up in the present. As I welcomed and held space for the black hole, it shapeshifted into a fluid, sticky web or tar-like substance that the flailer 
was stuck in. It dawned on me that this part that flails was not lost and falling in a black hole, but was being held down and trapped with power over energy as a protective mechanism by this black goo. I realized that when I felt the similar energy of separation, I would quickly sense that flail and the power over energy trying to contain and protect me from feeling this. And I would then react by wielding power over as a reflection of what is happening internally. As I felt awe and understanding of this reactive loop, I sat curiously with this protective webby tar like substance with the question of what else it might want to do in my system if it didn't have to protect me from feeling this flail or wound of separation. At that point, I sensed its shape shift again into an intelligent matrix of interconnection, which I'll come back to in a moment. In my breathwork session, I had a visual of a strong and violent hand thumping down on my heart like a loud drum beat or the violent yet life-saving act of CPR. I recognize the beauty and intention of care and support in this resuscitation, yet was drawn to the energy of power over in such acts. To me, this represents moments in time that we learn to engage in power over tactics to fix, to heal, to save lives, to rescue. And because it works or it worked once, it also perpetuates violence. Through exploration of the space where disconnection happens, I landed on some key qualities and reminders to practice leading from my heart rather than implementing power over or reacting to power over with more power over. These qualities appeared as first patience and choice. From there, I recognized to see power over as stuck energy. I then was moved to feel into the trust in the intelligence that is here, that we are, that the earth is. So that in moments where I sense power over energy in someone else or the discomfort inside myself that had been historically met with power over to fix, avoid, or inoculate what felt unstable, Instead, I can now invite in this remembering to open up to the higher intelligence that is within me, within others, and in the space between. And I can collaborate there rather than charge forward as if I have to do it on my own. Lastly, I named this space as a healing space. Upon further reflection and inner work, I have come to realize that this little one who flails was holding a core belief that she is alone and it is not safe to trust anyone. The paradox that struck me and led to an important shift was the recognition that the intelligent shape-shifting matrix of interconnection is the exact medicine or antidote to this belief of separation, loneliness, and a lack of trust. When this intelligent goo was restraining this flailer with power over energy, rather than supporting her as interconnection, my system was continually recreating the original wound, perpetually returning to what was stuck in the past. Drischel surmised that in attempting to protect itself, the organism infects itself over and over again with the memory of the outside force that threatened and continues to threaten it in order to incorporate that threat into the organism, to bring it to conscious recollection in order that it may no longer threaten. This repetitive seeing therefore acts as an immunization, attempting to provide resistance and defense against any repeat attack. The problem is when this defense against the defense is not resolved, the threat we seek to inoculate is on the inside and we have built up so much protection that we now become ill from the inside out, akin to an autoimmune disease. As I continue to practice recentering my heart and decentering power over, the flail continues to quiet 
and dissipates as this little one is nourished and supported rather than restrained. What has become more clear to me throughout this process is reflected in the words of Audre Lorde, who says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. One of the master's tools is power over. And I'm confident that my experience has helped me understand the danger and harm of utilizing power over in the name of helping. Lakota scholar and teacher Chiokasin Ghost Horse details the importance of perceiving the English language as one of domination, possession, separation, and containment. And he says, we cannot liberate ourselves or wake ourselves up with the same language that put us asleep or boxed us in. Ghost Horse also makes reference to Einstein's infamous quote that similarly cautions, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. This has brought me to a place of being mindful and attentive to the words I choose and the importance of recentering my heart as I decentralize power over. Chiokasen shares a lesson he learned from his mother that the thinking mind, which thinks it is the intelligence, is actually a seed of the heart. In Lakota, this means we think from our heart and our brains are a tool of the heart. Our intellectualism comes from the thinking mind, but our intelligence is from the heart. While much of the English language is continuously distancing us from this intelligence, it is our work, our responsibility to slow down, be mindful of the energy within the words we choose to use and come back to leading from our heart. As an experience to embody this for yourself, I invite you to pull out a piece of paper and draw a spiral on that paper. This is a practice of radical inclusion and welcoming. What you will do once you have your spiral is place your attention, maybe your pen or your finger on the outside of the spiral and begin to tune into something you are struggling with in your life. It could be a reaction, a feeling, an incessant thought, a habit, um, a sensation, an impulse, anything at all that you are struggling with in your life. Just choosing one. Once you have it, once you've named it, welcome it, right? It's here already. So this is a practice of welcoming, opening yourself to it, including it, welcoming it. And then slowly with your finger or your attention, walk the spiral towards the center as you continue welcoming this struggle, opening your arms to it. And at the center, pause. Here is where you feel into a heartfelt quality or reminder that will support you with this struggle. Something that might provide a little more balance or a little more space for you to be with what's here. Maybe it's compassion, trust, presence, anything at all, feel into the space. What would be supportive? What will help you in your continuing welcoming? And once you feel you have landed on that support you need, you are equally inviting it in as you are opening to it. And then walk yourself out of the spiral, bringing with you the support you need. You can pause the video here 
if you need a little more space and time. Moving into the final reflection. As I integrate my learnings and experience from this project, I am more clear in my direction and desire to align with a social work model of practice that is both transformative and eclectic with interdisciplinary relational accountability and equity as core features. This must include a critical framework that encourages the ongoing deconstruction of power over internally and externally by way of tangible practices that are focused on recentering the heart. As a transformational social worker, I must embody a holistic approach and align with ontologies of relationality and interconnectedness and collaborate and co-conspire with other visionary and creative practitioners. Additionally, I feel called to heed the suggestion of Resma Menachem and create safe space for white bodied people to come together to build a culture around reckoning with generations of trauma that has led to the perpetuation of internalized and systemic racism, as well as building capacity and anti-fragility around racialized topics of conversation. These will not be spaces of exclusion and all are welcome to be a part of this journey and experience. Systems change requires individual work in dismantling implicit bias and updating mental models, participation in healthy relationships and seeing and questioning power dynamics and a broader scope and, exper and experience to deconstruct and reconstruct from the heart, our policies, practices and resources. So in conclusion, may we remember to recognize the interconnection between interpersonal and interpersonal and come to see that how we interact with ourselves and the world around us has the potential to change the entire universe. Thank you. I would be happy to connect, reach out, send me a message. I'd love to hear about your experience in this presentation with me. Thank you.